Hi folks, I'm International Master John Watson. In this video, I'll be introducing my new series, Tricks and Traps in the Chess Openings, produced by ICC, the Internet Chess Club. There are literally thousands of tricks and traps in the openings, and obviously I can't show you all of them, but I've decided upon a few selection criteria. First of all, I want my examples to be useful, which means concentrating upon ideas that can plausibly arise over many uh, openings and that might show up in real games and contain ideas that might show up from a variety of openings. So this is not an amazing move series, as much fun as those are, and I do want it to be entertaining. I, I won't be able to resist showing a few very beautiful traps and tricks that probably won't even be seen in your games, but, but, but by far the majority of examples will be on typical ways in which your opponent can uh, either be fooled by you or, of course, at the same time, these tricks and traps will be things that you, I'll try to help you avoid being fooled yourself. So, okay, so for each part of the series, I'm going to deal with a different opening complex. For example, traps after e4, e5, or traps in the Sicilian defense, or traps in the King's Indian, or traps in the Queen's Gambit. So we'll see various traps from every standard opening, at least one or two traps from every opening, and quite a few traps from others. So I'll begin with simple tricks and traps geared at the inexperienced player, and then we'll look at more complex examples for each video as the subject develops. So tricks and traps can be a lot of fun, and they can also be extremely useful. And one thing to remember about traps, opening traps, is that the same tactical themes can appear much later in the game, even in the end game, but certainly in the, in the middle game, you might run into the exact same idea. So you're also building up your library of tricks and ideas and tricky moves and things to look for. The, the pattern recognition will be assisted by learning these opening traps. So let's take a step back and ask what an opening trick or a trap really is. And it's not really just a matter of tactics, although tactics are often involved. Um, Yakov Neistat defines a trap as the, quote, provocation of a mistake. That is, a trap depends upon the opponent playing a natural move. That's what he calls, he's, quote, natural, or a natural sequence of moves. So that's fine, and it makes sense, uh, and I think it's true. But let's face it, that does depend on what looks natural to your opponent, which in turn depends upon his or her strength. So a super elementary example of this that everyone knows about involves the, uh, a type of scholar's mate, or just any scholar's mate, where you might say, I'll just show you a silly beginner's thing here. You're threatening checkmate. Queen takes f7 checkmate. And um, what if black plays here and allows that checkmate? Well, you might say that that's white has tricked black. That was sort of a trap. Well, you might say that's kind of silly. How is knight f6 natural? Well, maybe for a beginner it is, because it develops a piece, uh, it prepares castling, and it wins time by attacking the queen, which came out early in the game. So which is, these are things that a book might have, he might have read in a book, or maybe a teacher might have said. So, so one person's completely unnatural might be another person's natural. So in a sense, this is for a beginner. Maybe the scholar's mate is a bit of a, a trick or a trap. Uh, and, and just for a slightly less element, but still very elementary example, maybe a beginner would say, okay, I've stopped mate, I recognize the mate on f7, and I've attacked the queen, but then not realize that he's fallen for this double attack on the king and rook. Okay, so you might say that's ridiculously simple. Um, and that's not something that I'm very interested in, and doesn't, it doesn't really isn't very relevant to, to anybody, most people's play who are watching this video. But let me show you another kind of trap also arising very early in the game that comes up in many forms in various openings. And in spite of being ridiculously simple, it has fooled many grandmasters, uh, many masters and some grandmasters, and a lot more very, very experienced players. And I'll mention that as I go along. So let me just show you the first basic uh, idea. Um, or give you an example, the first basic idea, which is uh, in the Trumpovsky opening, it can come up, for example. And I'll show you, it'll come up in a lot of examples. Sometimes black will make this move. And white might think, well, okay, first of all, black might be trying to support d5, but not commit to it yet. And he might still want to hold forth the idea of playing d6, too. So it's sort of a flexible move. And another idea that's pretty obvious uh, is queen b6, which is a very common move against the Trumpovsky. Queen b6 attacking the b2 square because it's no longer protected by this bishop. So if you're an experienced Trumpovsky player, you might think, okay, that's what black's trying to do. 
and uh, maybe you haven't had your coffee yet, and you just go, okay, well, I'm going to just develop my pieces like I always do. I'm going to play E3, and now I don't know if you see it, but that's actually a blunder because black can play here. You've fallen into, you've fallen for a trick. The trick is that uh, the king is in check and the bishop's hanging, and a strong player who wins a piece will win the game, and that's after only three moves. So um, you might say, well, that's kind of crazy to fall for that, but this time I have to say that it's something that's been that's happened very often. It, the trick uh, appears 13 times in my main database, which is not really that big. It's sort of a useful database, and it includes a grandmaster who fell for this as white. So you see, this is something he, the grandmaster is not fall is not going to fall for the scholar's mate, but something really pretty much as simple. Um, uh, people do actually fall for. So that theme is interesting. We'll talk about why it is that maybe people could fall for a trick like that as opposed to some other as opposed to some other kinds of tricks. So let me show you how this theme can come up in it actually can come up in six or seven different openings that I could count, but I'm going to show you at least in three different openings. I'm going to throw show you in the Sicilian defense um, how this can come up. Here, here's one example. This move is not incredibly pop popular, but it's uh, the idea is to take over the center and not have to retake with a knight after d4. And black almost always plays here to get a counterattack on this pawn. And then um, now there's a move that white can make, this move bishop here, just to get castled quickly and then worry about moving his center pawns. So, so it's just a developing move, but it looks at first sight that it's just a blunder because that's a center pawn. Center pawns are valuable and it's an extra pawn and black can simply grab it and in fact has fairly often grabbed that pawn but it's a trap because of queen a4 check. So it's very much like the one we just saw. It's a fork, and the queen can move horizontally along the, uh, <clears throat> all the in, in order to take the knight after the after black does something about the check. So, so that's a little trick, and you might think, well, that's you know almost as silly as the last one, but this one, let me see, has occurred um, 220 times in my database including a few masters, no, no grand masters, but a few masters and uh, dozens of players rated over 2,000. And 2,000 is a pretty high rating. Probably most of you people listening to this are not that strong, but, but uh, here we have 220 people who, who fell for this trick. So obviously there's something going on that that's something that you can easily miss. So there's a little, there's an example. Let me show you some other examples of this. Um, uh, okay, here's a, here's another Sicilian, for example. Now, once in a while, white will play this move. And if he plays this now, it's called the Mora Gambit. But sometimes white plays this move first. And what he's doing is he's trying to commit black to making some, picking a certain kind of Sicilian, then he'll respond accordingly. For example, if black plays here now, trying to get into a dragon or a knight off, sometimes white will play queen takes here and play into that kind of system. Or he might go ahead and play into a Mora Gambit kind of thing. But... Um, it's sort of a technical point, because if white wanted that position, you might think, well, why can't he do it this way? And then take with the queen after black takes, but black could always play here first, and then take, and now taking with the queen isn't so good. So it's just a small point. Uh, anyway, so after this d4 move, the idea is that white can also just play here right now and see what black does. And, and one, one drawback to this is that maybe black can play this move, protecting the pawn. And white might say, whoops, wait a minute, what are you doing here? I'll just grab that because it's the center pawn. And again, now we're getting used to this idea. There's a check which wins that piece. So knight takes e5 is just a blunder. And this, uh, let me see, a slightly less serious mistake. Let me show you this one in the Sicilian. We'll stick with the Sicilian for a while. Is um, after this, whoops, sorry, a little mistake there. Okay, so there, takes, and let's say, oh, well, black can play here, and now a very obvious thing is that knight's kind of vulnerable to this attack because it's really got no squares to go to, and d5 is very awkward. But the reason that white doesn't normally play that is because it's a trick. Because black has set a trap there, he plays check, and then he takes a pawn, and he's a full pawn up, an extra center pawn, and that's very strong. So that's a little trick. But believe it or not, white has fallen for this 190 times in the database. It's just such a natural thing to do to play e5. And um, you can see these same sort of things in the, uh, in the English opening, too. So let me show you a little bit about that. Let me bring up uh, another board here.
and and we'll talk about why people would fall for this, because I want to do that during the series, kind of talk about the psychological reasons why some of these tricks actually work. Uh, let's go through the main line here first. There's several English openings, but let's just look at one or two of them. Start out with this one. Okay, now that's a normal symmetrical English position here. Black plays there, very, very common, getting his bishop out. And sometimes white will play this move. And it makes a lot of sense, this move, because it covers these that newly weakened square there. So let's say black did something really dumb, like slow. White could play this move, threatening knight c7 check, knight d6 check. It's really be fun, right? So you'll see this move at bishop f4 played once in a while. Not super often, but once in a while. And um, there's a real big problem with it. And the big problem is that black can actually go there, attacking two pieces. And white's only real move is to take that pawn, and then guess what? We have our trick again. Now this one, now bishop f4 isn't played that often, but it has been played some. It's happened 24 times in my database, and 14 times black actually played e5 and won a piece and won most of the games, probably all the games. Um, so black found that move. What's interesting is that means that 10 times black didn't find it, so both white and black missed this move. White, white allowed it, and black didn't find it. <laughs> so it's interesting that these things are not necessarily that obvious, even though they win on the spot. I mean, it wins a piece on the spot, but... Doesn't, it's interesting that these things can, can happen even among you know, fairly good players. Uh, another example of this is, um, let me just show you, uh, c4, knight of six, maybe the order doesn't matter much here. I'll just get to the position here, here, here. Uh, and white might play there. And black wants to prevent white from going d4 and e4. Maybe, maybe he's a little worried about e4, but he also wants to get this piece out before he plays this move and blocks off this piece, this piece here, this bishop. So he wants to get this bishop out, so he zooms out here. And um, and that way he stops this move e4, but he also, after bishop here, he's going to be able to play that move, get his bishop out, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there's a problem, and you've probably guessed it already by now, which is this move. Attacks two pieces, and after black takes it, white wins a whole piece, and then, and then wins the game, or at least has a completely winning game. So that's another kind of English opening thing. I think I'll stop there with the English opening, but um, this actually, by this way, this, this one only happened 10 times in my database, but guess what? In, in uh, four of them, only, only out of four out of 10 games did white play the move e4. So it's good to know these tricks. I mean, if you're in the middle of a game, you might just automatically play with bishop g2, missing the chance to win a whole piece and gain a point and go home early. Um, so it's interesting that half the time white didn't actually even play e4 in, in my database. Okay, and then one real quick other thing. So I just want to show that these things come up in almost any, some of these themes, it doesn't really matter what you play, you'll find that they can, they can occur anyway. And just as an example of that, and this is a really silly example, if you were playing something irregular like the Grobe attack, you can get these kind of themes. Um, also come up in the Caro can and a variety of other things. This this queen a4 and queen a5 thing comes up really often. Uh, for example, one of the main lines here is this. Uh, white gives away that pawn in order to attack, and the idea is that that b7 is unprotected. So black just defends, and white captures, and then white attacks the pawn again here twice. And black, if he's you know hasn't really been aware or thinking very hard, might just throw in this move. And guess what? That loses again to our favorite check followed by captures. Notice that that wouldn't have worked last move because um, because the bishop, either the queen could have come up to, or the bishop even could have come back. So you wouldn't have won a piece until you got that e6 move in. And, um, well, I think that's enough. But, but even in a regular opening, you can get this kind of thing. So what's going on here? Let's talk about how in general this 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 can happen. Things like this can happen. Um, it turns out there are certain kinds of moves, sometimes very simple ones, that uh, chess players tend to have blind spots about, e even grandmasters. Um, Afek and Nyman have a book called Invisible Chess Moves, which categorizes and describes these sort of mental slips, these blind spots, including so-called obvious moves that grand even grandmasters can miss. Uh, most of their categories of these moves apply to the middle game uh, and the end game and the opening. Uh, so... They show examples of all those things, but what's interesting is the same tricks that apply in the middle game will very often also apply to different openings. 
So you're expanding in both directions. If you learn the opening tri trips and tricks and traps, your middle game should theoretically improve too, because you'll notice the same kind of tricks in the middle game. Um, but anyway, there are certain kinds of moves that we have blindness towards. <clears throat> One of the famous ones is backward moves along a diagonal, especially by a queen. Uh, but to, to a lesser extent, players also tend to overlook um, backwards and, ho and horizontal rook moves and, and queen moves. Horizontal uh, queen moves are sort of hard to find. Well, guess what? Here we've got, in all of these examples, we have a horizontal queen move that's easy to overlook. It's just odd that people don't really tend to see those things. Same thing with all those queen a5 checks and queen g5s. The key move was this horizontal, being sort of seeing this side move. And that's why this tactic works, is because of our reluctance somehow to see that. And I thought I'd just show you another thing is um, backwards diagonal queen moves are very uh, extremely common things to miss. <clears throat> so I'll show you that, even though it's not relevant to our queen a5 check theme. Let me just show you a game, a famous game, actually. Um, between Larry Christensen, a three-time U.S. champion, and a world champion, Anatoly Karpov. So I'm not going to go over the theory. <laughs> I'll just show you the first few moves. They're all book moves, all very well-known moves, all the way up to here. Still book moves. Still book moves. And um, black plays there to drive, drive white off this good diagonal. Black is Karpov, by the way. Uh, Larry Christensen plays here. <clears throat> and now the problem is black's, white's about to play here and attack that knight and force it back, and the knight's going to have lost time playing knight h5. <clears throat> so Karpov decides, well, I'm going to support that knight. Now after bishop e2, I'll just play here. And um, that's fine, because I'll, I'll be attacking. The knight can always retreat if it has to. Anyway, it's in good shape here. And um, if maybe castles, maybe I'll play bishop f4, or maybe I'll play queen b8. I don't know, but something like that is probably a very useful move. Um, but there's a problem with this move. I don't know if anybody can see it. Uh, you give yourself a second. You can always pause the video and look, or you can just maybe see it right away. Um, to, his to his amazement here, after Karpov played bishop d6, he had to resign on the next move. Shortest game Karpov ever lost. What's the next move? It's that move. Well, that's incredibly simple. It might even be easier for a beginner than for an experienced player, because an experienced player knows that the themes in this position, the reason he put his queen on c2 was to defend this, but also to castle queenside. That's that's a major point of putting the queen on c2. And when you develop a queen off the last rank, you, you certainly don't want to bring it back again, because you just moved it and block the idea that you had, which was castling queenside. But as you can see, two pieces are attacked, and white simply wins the game, and, it's, and so um, Karpov resigned. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that's the shortest game he ever lost. I'd be very surprised, except maybe some blitz game or something. <clears throat> so that's that's the backwards thing. Now, how could a very experienced master, getting back to our queen a5 and queen a4 themes, let's look at a game. You'll wonder how the heck an experienced master could fall for this one. Let me show you this. Uh, this is another game. Uh, percentage. <clears throat> Sorry, a little slow here on the uptake. There we go. Um, Sometimes it's almost easier for an experienced player to fall for a trap than for an inexperienced one. And, and just for example, you know those Trompowskis we were looking at? Um, a lot of players as, black, as white are very used to that kind of move, to bring the queen to b6. So, and then they play here, and the queen comes to b6, and there's a, you can gambit a pawn here or do various other things. Or even after this move, you can come to b6 and attack here. So one, one reason an experienced player might be more likely to fall for this than an inexperienced one is because when he sees that move c6, he's thinking about that same queen b6 move, and he might very carelessly forget that the queen can also go to a5, whereas a beginner might not do that. Now here's another example that's very much like that, um, or has the sort of same theme. Let me just show it to you first. So that's a queen's gambit accepted, plays move c6. Now he plays this strange move to protect the, the, the pawn was about to be taken by the bishop. Very odd move. <clears throat> and white plays this move to get rid of the bishop. And the idea is if the bishop moves here, you just take the pawn. If the bishop doesn't move, you, take, you get rid of that very valuable piece. And um, <clears throat> so it seems like a good move, except you may know by now that black's going to play this move, check, winning. Now, let me just tell you that um, this trick has occurred 16 times in my database with the three players of white rated above 2,500. 
and having all three of them having an IM or a GM title. And no fewer than 13 of the people who fell for this had a rating of 2198 or higher. That is about 2200 or higher. And in contrast, there are 300 players below a 2100 rating, most of them, the majority of them below 1700, who didn't play Knight G5, did, maybe didn't even consider Knight G5. Well, did they not play it because they saw the trap? Well, who knows? But partly they didn't play it because they aren't familiar with the ideas of this position. It's actually knowledge is not bliss in this case. Uh, and let me show you what I mean by that. A couple of other lines go, let me just show you a couple of these, um, go, for example, like this. And whoops, like that, and c4. Here's one. Here's a Slav defense, for example, where a lot of times black will take here, white will go here, attacking that pawn, and black will play this bishop b6 move. White goes ahead and plays here, which I think is the best move, and then black might play something like uh, knight f6, and white plays here, attacking that bishop. And notice now that black doesn't have this check, but this is a standard line. It was played many, many times for a while, although I think white eventually, since white gets the better game, um, see, if, if if black moves this, not only is he going to get that lose that pawn with tempo, but also there's going to be an e4 move. So the natural move for black, since he doesn't want to give up this pawn, is to play here, and then after this to counterattack here. With the idea that the knight moves, he can win the e-pawn, but instead white just plays there, plays here, and White's got the better game, as it turns out. It's not overwhelmingly better, but it is better. And um, White can play, for example, that move. This guy's hanging, and this guy's hanging, and <clears throat> White ends up with a space advantage in a nice game. So so the player who played this game, those 2,500 players, they, they're thinking of this line when they play that knight g5. They're just not quite awake yet or something. And they, they think they're in a line that they're not in. That can happen if you know sort of too much about a kind of position. Another example here would be, um, let me just show you this one, knight here, knight here. There's also different orders by which you can get to that same position, so it comes up fairly often. Here, bishop here, uh, knight g5 here, and you notice there's no queen a5 check. So this has, been, this has happened a lot of times too, this position. White is probably slightly better, and white has studied this position and decides that um, he likes it. He likes to play this position. So somehow when this game starts these 2500 players are going oh i know what to do against bishop a6 you just play knight g5 so they throw the move out there lose a piece and have to resign <laughs> so, so just to show you kind of how a, a strong player could make this kind of mistake sometimes it's better actually not to know anything about a position because weaker players aren't even aware of these knight g5 lines all right, that's a start on this whole topic. Uh, uh, both of, I gave you sort of a thematic way of looking at uh, um, a certain kind of mistake that can be made and try to explain why those kinds of mistakes might be made. Next video, I'll introduce tricks and traps that arise after the classical moves, E4, E5, and we'll spend a couple of videos on that since there are many, many, many tricks and traps after that. So I hope you enjoyed this introductory video and I hope you'll continue to watch the rest of the series. Thank you.